The Story of William Wilson, Part 1 Let me call myself, for the present, William Wilson. That is not my real name. That name has already been the cause of the horror, of the anger of my family. Have not the winds carried my name with my loss of honor to the ends of the earth? Am I not forever dead to the world, to its honors, to its flowers, to its golden hopes, and the cloud heavy and endless? Does it not hang forever between my hopes and my heaven? Men usually become bad by degrees, but I let all goodness fall from me in a single moment, as if I had dropped a coat. From small acts of darkness I passed in one great step into the blackest evil ever known. Listen, while I tell you of the cause that made this happen. Death is near, and its coming has softened my spirit. I desire in passing through this dark valley the understanding of other men. I wish them to believe that I have been in some ways in the power of forces beyond human control. I wish them to find for me in the story I'm about to tell some small fact that proves I could only have done what I did. I would have them agree that what happened to me never happened to other men. Is it not true that no one has ever suffered as I do? Have I not indeed been living in a dream? And am I not now? Dying from the horror and the unanswered question? The mystery of the wildest dream ever dreamed on earth. I am one of a family well known for their busy minds. As a small child, I showed clearly that I too had the family character. As I became older, it grew more powerful in me. For many reasons it became a cause of talk among friends, and the hurt it did me was great. I wanted people always to do things my way. I acted like a fool. I let my desires control me. My father and mother, weak in body and mind, could do little to hold me back. When their efforts failed, of course, my will grew stronger. And from then on my voice in the house was law. At an age when few children are allowed to be free, I was left to be guided by my own desires. I became the master of my own actions. I remember my first school. It was in a large house, about three hundred years old, in a small town in England among a great number of big trees. All of the houses there were very old. In truth, it was a dreamlike and spirit-quieting place, that old town. At this moment I seemed to feel the pleasant coolness under the shade of the trees. I remember the sweetness of the flowers. I hear again with delight, I cannot explain, the deep sound of the church bell each hour breaking the stillness of the day. It gives me pleasure to think about this school, as much pleasure, perhaps, as I am now able to experience. Deep in suffering as I am, suffering only too real, perhaps no one will object if for a short time I forget my troubles and tell a little about this period. Moreover, the period and place are important. It was then and there that I first saw hanging over me the terrible promise of things to come, 
Ah, let me remember. The house where we boys lived and went to school was, as I have said, old and wide. The grounds about it were large, and there was a high wall around the outside of the whole school. Beyond this wall we went three times in each week, on one day to take short walks in the neighboring fields, and two times on Sunday to go to church. This was the one church in the village, and the head teacher of our school was also the head of the church. With a spirit of deep wonder and of doubt, I used to watch him there. This man with slow step and quiet, thoughtful face, in clothes so different and shining clean. Could this be the same man who, with a hard face and clothes far from clean, stood ready to strike us if we did not follow the rules of the school? Oh, great and terrible question! beyond my small power to answer. I well remember our playground, which was behind the house. There were no trees, and the ground was as hard as stone. In front of the house there was a small garden, but we stepped into this garden only at very special times, such as when we first arrived at school, or when we left it for the last time or perhaps when father or mother or a friend came to take us away for a few days. But the house! What a delightful old building it was! To me, truly a palace! There was really no end to it. I was not always able to say certainly which of its two floors I happened to be on. From each room to every other there were always three or four steps either up or down. Then the rooms branched into each other, and these branches were too many to count, and often turned and came back upon themselves. Our ideas about the whole great house were not very far different from the thoughts we had about time without end. During the five years I was there, I could never have told anyone how to find the little room where I and some eighteen or twenty other boys slept. The schoolroom was the largest room in the house, and I couldn't help thinking it was the largest in the world. It was long and low, with pointed windows and heavy wood overhead. In a far corner was the office of our head teacher. Mr. Pransby. This office had a thick door, and we would rather have died than open it when he was not there. Inside the thick walls of this old school, I passed my years from ten to fifteen. Yet I always found it interesting. A child's mind does not need the outside world. In the quiet school I found more bright pleasure than I found later as a young man in riches, or as an older man, in wrongdoing. Yet I must have been different indeed from most boys. Few men remember much of their early life. My early days stand out as clear and plain as if they had been cut in gold. In truth, the hotness of my character and my desire to lead and command soon separated me from the others. Slowly I gained control over all who were not greatly older than myself. Over all, except one. This exception was a boy who, though not of my family, had the same name as my own, William Wilson. This boy was the only one who ever dared to say he did not believe all I told him, and who would not follow my commands. This troubled me greatly. I tried to make the others think that I didn't care. The truth was that I felt afraid of him. I had to fight to appear equal with him, but he easily kept himself equal with me. Yet no one else felt, as I did, that this proved him the better of the two. Indeed, no one else saw the battle going on between us. 
All his attempts to stop me in what I wanted to do were made when no one else could see or hear us. He did not desire, as I did, to lead the other boys. He seemed only to want to hold me back, sometimes with wonder and always without pleasure. I saw that his manner seemed to show a kind of love for me. I did not feel thankful for this. I thought it meant only that he thought himself to be very fine indeed, better than me. Perhaps it was this love he showed for me, added to the fact that we had the same name, and also that we had entered the school on the same day, which made people say that we were brothers. Wilson did not belong to my family, even very distantly. But if we had been brothers, we would have been near to each other indeed, for I learned that we were both born on the 19th of January, 1809. This seemed a strange and wonderful thing. The Story of William Wilson, Part 2 In the first part of my story I spoke about my life at my first school and about the other boys, over whom I gained firm control. But there was one boy who would not follow my commands, who would not do what I told him to as the other boys did. His name was the same as mine, William Wilson. Although he did not belong to my family in any way, he seemed to feel some love for me, and had entered the school the same day as I had. Many of the boys thought we were brothers. I soon discovered that we had been born on the same day, January 19th, 1809. Wilson continued his attempts to command me, while I continued my attempts to rule him. The strange thing is that, although I did not like him, I could not hate him. We had a battle nearly every day, it is true. In public it would seem that I had been proved the stronger, but he seemed somehow able to make me feel that this was not true, and that he himself was stronger. Nevertheless, we continued to talk to each other in a more or less friendly way. On a number of subjects we agreed very well. I sometimes thought that if we had met at another time and place we might have become friends. It is not easy to explain my real feelings toward him. There was no love, and there was no fear, yet I saw something to honor in him. I wanted to learn more about him. Anyone experienced in human nature will not need to be told that Wilson and I were always together. This strange appearance of friendship, although we were not friends, caused no doubt the strangeness of battle between us. I tried to make the others laugh at him. I tried to give him pain while seeming to play a light-hearted game. My attempts were not always successful, even though my plans were well made. There was much about his character that simply could not be laughed at. I could find, indeed, but one weakness. Perhaps he had been born with it, or perhaps it had come from some illness. No one but me would have made any use of it against him. He was able to speak only in a very, very soft, low voice. This weakness I never failed to use in any way that was in my power. Wilson could fight back, and he did. 
there was one way he had of troubling me beyond measure. I had never liked my name. Too many other people had the same name. I would rather have had a name that was not so often heard. The word sickened me. When on the day I arrived at the school, a second William Wilson came also, I felt angry with him for having the name. I knew I would have to hear the name each day a double number of times. The other William Wilson would always be near. The other boys often thought that my actions and my belongings were his, and his were mine. My anger grew stronger with every happening that showed that William Wilson and I were alike in body or in mind. I had not then discovered the surprising fact that we were of the same age, but I saw that we were of the same height, and I saw that in form and in face we were also much the same. Nothing could trouble me more deeply. Although I carefully tried to keep everyone from seeing it, and to hear anyone say anything about the likeness between us of mind or of body or of anything else. But in truth, I had no reason to believe that this likeness was ever noticed by our schoolfellows. He saw it, and as clearly as I, that I knew well. He discovered that in this likeness he could always find a way of troubling me. This proved the more than usual sharpness of his mind. His method, which was to increase the likeness between us, lay both in words and in actions, and he followed his plan very well indeed. It was easy enough to have clothes like mine. He easily learned to walk and move as I did. His voice, of course, could not be as loud as mine, but he made his manner of speaking the same. Ah, oh, how greatly this most careful picture of myself troubled me, I will not now attempt to tell. It seemed that I was the only one who noticed it. I was the only one who saw Wilson's strange and knowing smiles, pleased with having produced in my heart the desired result. He seemed to laugh within himself and cared nothing that no one laughed with him. I have already spoken of how he seemed to think he was better and wiser than I. He would try to guide me. He would often try to stop me from doing things I had planned. He would tell me what I should and should not do, and he would do this not openly, but in a word or two in which I had to look for the meaning. As I grew older, I wanted less and less to listen to him. As it was, I could not be happy under his eyes that always watched me. Every day I showed more and more openly that I did not want to listen to anything he told me. I have said that in the first years when we were in school together, my feelings might easily have been turned to friendship. But in the later months, although he talked to me less often then, I almost hated him. Yet let me be fair to him. I can remember no time when what he told me was not wiser than would be expected from one of his years. His sense of what was good or bad was sharper than my own. I might today be a better and happier man if I had more often done what he said. It was about the same period, if I remember rightly, that by chance he acted more openly than usual, and I discovered in his manner something that deeply interested me. Somehow he brought to mind pictures of my earliest years. I remembered, it seemed, things I could not have remembered. These pictures were wild, half-lighted and not clear, but I felt that 
Very long ago I must have known this person standing before me. This idea, however, passed as quickly as it had come. It was on this same day that I had my last meeting at the school with this other strange William Wilson. That night, when everyone was sleeping, I got out of bed, and with a light in my hand, I went quietly through the house to Wilson's room. I had long been thinking of another of those plans to hurt him, with which I had until then had little success. It was my purpose now to begin to act according to this new plan. Having reached his room, I entered without a sound. Leaving the light outside, I advanced a step and listened. He was asleep. I turned and took the light and again went to the bed. I looked down upon his face. The coldness of ice filled my whole body. My knees trembled, my whole spirit was filled with horror. I moved the light nearer to his face. Was this, this the face of William Wilson? I saw, indeed, that it was. But I trembled as if with sickness as I imagined that it was not. What was there in his face to trouble me so? I looked and my mind seemed to turn in circles in the rush of my thoughts. It was not like this, surely not like this, that he appeared in the daytime. The same name, the same body, the same day that we came to school. And then there was his use of my way of walking, my manner of speaking. Was it in truth humanly possible that what I now saw was the result, and the result only, of his continued efforts to be like me? Filled with wonder and fear, cold and trembling, I put out the light. In the quiet darkness I went from his room, and without waiting one minute, I left The Story of William Wilson, Part 3 You will remember that in the last part of my story, I told of my experiences in my first school. I spoke of my early meetings with a boy who looked and behaved as I did, whose name was even the same as mine. William Wilson. I told of the night when I went to Wilson's room with a plan to hurt him. What I saw that night so frightened me that I left the room and the school forever. As I stood, looking down at his sleeping form and face, I might have been looking at myself in a looking-glass. It was not like this, surely not like this, that he appeared in the daytime. The same name, the same face, the same body, the same day of coming to school, and then his use of my way of walking, my manner of speaking. Was it in truth humanly possible that what I now saw was the result, and the result only? of his continued efforts to be like me? Afraid, I left the old school and never entered it again. After some months at home, doing nothing, I went to study at the famous school called Eton. I had partly forgotten my days at the other school, or at least... My feelings about those days had changed. The truth, the terrible truth of what had happened there, was gone. Now I doubted what I remembered. Now I called the subject into my mind only to smile at the strength of the strange ideas and thoughts I had once had. My life at Eton did not change this view. 
the fool's life into which i carelessly threw myself washed away everything that was valuable in my past i do not wish however to tell here the story of my wrongdoing wrongdoing which went against every law of the school and escaped the watchful eyes of all the teachers three years of this had passed and i had grown much larger in body and smaller in soul three years of wrongdoing had made me evil one night i asked a group of friends who were as evil as i to come to a secret meeting in my room we met at a late hour there was strong drink and there were games of cards loud talking until the new day began appearing in the east warm with the wine and with the games of chance i was raising my glass to drink in honor of some especially evil idea when i heard the voice of a servant outside the room he said that someone had asked to speak with me in another room i was delighted a few steps brought me into the hall of the building in this room no light was hanging but i could see the form of a young man about my own height wearing clothes like those i myself was wearing his face i could not see when i had entered he came quickly up to me and taking me by the arm he said softly in my ear william wilson there was something in the manner of the stranger and in the trembling of his uplifted finger which made my eyes open wide but it was not this which had so strongly touched my mind and heart it was the sound of those two simple well-known words william wilson which reached into my soul before i could think again and speak he was gone for some weeks i thought about this happening who and what was this wilson where did he come from and what were his purposes i learned that for family reasons he had suddenly left the other school on the afternoon of the day i myself had left it but in a short time i stopped thinking about the subject i gave all my thoughts to plans for study at oxford university there i soon went my father and mother sent me enough money to live like the sons of the richest families in england now my nature showed itself with double force i threw aside all honor among those who spent too much money i spent more and i added new forms of wrongdoing to the older ones already well known at the university and i fell still lower although it may not be easily believed it is a fact that i forgot my position as a gentleman i learned and used all the evil ways of those men who live by playing cards like such skilled gamblers i played to make money my friends trusted me however to them i was the laughing but honorable william wilson who freely gave gifts to anyone and everyone who was young and who had some strange ideas but who never did anything really bad for two years i was successful in this way then a young man came to the university a young man named glendinning who people said had quickly and easily become very rich i soon found him of weak mind this of course made it easy for me to get his money by playing cards i played with him often 
At first, with the gambler's usual skill, I let him take money from me. Then my plans were ready. I met him one night in the room of another friend, Mr. Preston. A group of eight or ten persons were there. By my careful planning, I made it seem that it was chance that started us playing cards. In fact, it was Glendinning himself who first spoke of a card game. We sat and played far into the night, and at last the others stopped playing. Glendinning and I played by ourselves while the others watched. The game was the one I liked best— a game called Eckhart. Glen Dinning played with a wild nervousness that I could not understand, though it was caused partly, I thought, by all the wine he had been drinking. In a very short time he had lost a great amount of money to me. Now he wanted to double the amount for which we played. This was as I had planned, but I made it seem that I did not want to agree. At last I said yes. In an hour he had lost four times as much money as before. For some reason his face had become white. I had thought him so rich that losing money would not trouble him, and I believed this whiteness, this... Paleness was the result of drinking too much wine. Now, fearing what my friends might say about me, I was about to stop the game when his broken cry and the wild look in his eyes made me understand that he had lost everything he owned. Weak of mind and made weaker by wine, he should never have been allowed to play that night. But I had not stopped him. I had used his condition to destroy him. The room was very quiet. I could feel the icy coldness in my friends. What I would have done I cannot say, for at that moment the wide, heavy doors of the room were suddenly opened. Every light in the room went out. But I had seen that a man entered. He was about my own height, and he was wearing a very fine long coat. The darkness, however, was now complete, and we could only feel that he was standing among us. Then we heard his voice. In a soft, low, never to be forgotten voice, which I felt deep in my bones, he said. Gentlemen, I am here only to do my duty. You cannot know the true character of the man who has tonight taken a large amount of money from Mr. Glendinning. Please have him take off his coat, and then look in it very carefully. While he was speaking, there was not another sound in the room. And as he ended, he was gone. The Story of William Wilson, Part 4 As I ended the last part of my story, I was speaking of that terrible evening when I played cards with a young gentleman called Glen Dinning. We were in the room of one of my friends at Oxford University. I had just realized that the young man, weak of mind and weakened by wine, had allowed me to win from him everything he owed. I was still trying to decide what I should do when, as I said, the wide, heavy doors of the room were suddenly opened, every light in the room went out. But I had seen that a stranger had entered. 
he was about my own height, and he was wearing a very fine, long coat. The darkness, however, was now complete, and we could only feel that he was standing among us. Then we heard him speak in a soft, low, never-to-be-forgotten voice, which I felt deep in my heart. He said, Gentlemen, I am here only to do my duty. You cannot know the true character of the man who has tonight taken a large amount of money from Mr. Glendinning. Please have him take off his coat, and then look in it very carefully. While he was speaking, there was not another sound in the room. As he ended, he was gone. Can I, shall I, tell what I felt? Need I say that I was afraid, that I felt the sick fear of those who are judged forever wrong? Many hands held me, lights were brought, my friends looked in my coat. In it they found all the high cards, the valuable cards needed to win in the game we had been playing. Secretly using these cards, I could have taken the money of anyone who played the game with me. Mr. Preston, in whose room we were, then said, Mr. Wilson, this is yours. He lifted from the floor a fine, warm coat and said, We shall not look in this to prove again what we have proved already. We have seen enough. You will understand, I hope, the need for you to leave the university. At the very least, you must leave my room and leave it now. Down in the dust, though my spirit was, I might have tried to strike him for those words if, at that moment, I had not noticed something very surprising. My coat had cost more money than most men could spend, and it had been made especially for me. It was different, I thought, from every other coat in the world. When, therefore, Mr. Preston gave me the coat which he had picked up from the floor, I saw with terror that my own was already hanging on my arm and that the two were alike in every way. I remembered that the strange being who had so mysteriously entered and left the room had had a coat. No one else in the room had been wearing one. I placed the coat offered by Mr. Preston over my own, and left his room. The next morning I began a hurried journey away from Oxford University. I ran, but I could not escape. I went from city to city, and in each one Wilson appeared. Paris, Rome, Vienna, Berlin, Moscow. He followed me everywhere. Years passed. I went to the very ends of the earth. I ran in fear, as if running from a terrible sickness, and still he followed. Again and again I asked myself, who is he? Where did he come from, and what was his purpose? But no answer was found. And then I looked with greatest care at the methods of his watch over me. I learned little. It was noticeable, indeed, that when he appeared now, it was only to stop me in those actions from which evil might result. But what right did he have to try to control me? I also noticed that although he always wore clothes the same as mine, he no longer let me see his face. Did he think I would not know him? He destroyed my honor at Oxford. He stopped me in my plans for getting a high position in Rome, in my love in Naples, in what he called my desire for too much money in Egypt. 
Did he think I could fail to see that he was the William Wilson of my schoolboy days, the hated and feared William Wilson? But let me hurry to the last scene in my story. Until now I had not tried to strike back. He was honorable and wise. He could be everywhere, and he knew everything. I felt such wonder and fear of him that I believed myself to be weak and helpless. Though it made me angry, I had done as he desired. But now I wanted more and more to escape his control. As I began to grow stronger, it seemed to me that he began to grow weaker. I felt a burning hope. In my deepest thoughts, I decided that I was going to be free. It was at Rome during the Carnival of 1835 that I went to a dance in the great house of the Duc de Broglio. I had been drinking more wine than is usual, and the room seemed... Very crowded and hot. I became angry as I pushed through the people. I was looking, let me not say why, I was looking for the young, the laughing, the beautiful wife of old de Brolio. Suddenly I saw her. But as I was trying to get through the crowd to join her, I felt a hand placed upon my shoulder, and that ever-remembered quiet voice within my ear. In a wild anger I took him in a stronghold. Wilson was dressed as I had expected, like myself, in a rich coat of blue. Around his body was a band of red cloth from which hung a long, sharp sword. A mask of black cloth completely covered his face. You again, I cried, my anger growing hotter with each word. Always you again. You shall not hunt me like this until I die. Come with me now or I will kill you where you stand. I pulled him after me into a small room nearby. I threw him against the wall and closed the door. I commanded him to take his sword in his hand. After a moment he took it and stood waiting. Ready to fight. Oh, the fight was short indeed. I was wild with hate and anger. In my arm I felt the strength of a thousand men. In a few moments I had forced him back against the wall, and he was in my power. Quickly, wildly, I put my sword's point again and again into his heart. At that moment I heard that someone was trying to open the door. I hurried to close it firmly and then turned back to my dying enemy. But what human words can tell the surprise, the, the horror, which filled me at the scene I then saw? The moment in which I had turned to close the door had been long enough, it seemed, for a great change to come at the far end of the room. A large mirror, a looking-glass, or so it seemed to me, now stood where it had not been before. As I walked toward it in terror, I saw my own form all spotted with blood, its face white advancing to meet me with a weak and uncertain step. So it appeared, I say, but was not. It was my enemy, it was Wilson, who then stood before me in the pains of death. His mask and coat lay upon the floor. In his dress and in his face there was nothing which was not my own. It was Wilson, but now it was my own voice I heard, as he said, I have lost, yet from now on you are also dead, dead to the world, dead to heaven, dead to hope. In me you lived, and in my death see by this 
face which is your own. How wholly, how completely you have...